In this video, we're going to be looking at topics 2.4, 2.5, and 2.7, ecological tolerance, natural disruptions to ecosystems, and ecological succession. Every ecosystem on Earth experiences changing conditions. Conditions may change slowly over geologic time, millions of years, over centuries or decades, seasonally in a single year, or even minute to minute. Temperature changes, the weather varies, droughts and deluges make water more or less available, and disease outbreaks take their toll on populations. While no ecosystem ever stops changing, when environmental conditions are consistent and nothing catastrophic is taking place, ecosystems experience relative stability. But changes can disturb ecosystems by affecting the size of a population, the rate at which a population grows or shrinks, and how populations interact with each other and their abiotic environment. Some species, due to their ecological niche, or role they play, have a particularly critical influence on their habitat. They may be a key component of the ecosystem's food web, be sensitive to even the slightest changes to conditions in the habitat, or be important in an ecosystem's recovery after a disturbance has taken place. Compared to any other species on Earth, humans have arguably altered the environment far more than any other species does. We dam rivers and divert water to places that naturally have very little of it. We alter soil chemistry in agricultural regions when we apply chemical fertilizers. We remove trees from large swaths of land to produce an important building material, lumber. We extract resources from the earth itself, like precious metals and fossil fuels. And of course, our combustion of those fossil fuels has resulted in changes to the global climate. But as a species, humans have only existed for about 200,000 years, and the majority of our impact has occurred only in the last 200 years. But over much longer periods of time, geologic time, natural processes have shaped and altered Earth ecosystems to a far greater extent than anything we are even capable of. The movement of Earth's tectonic plates have created mighty mountain ranges, like the Himalayas where the Indian subcontinent meets the rest of Asia, or the Rocky Mountains in the western part of the U.S. Sea levels have risen and fallen numerous times over the course of Earth's history. About 100 million years ago, while the dinosaurs still roamed the Earth, sea levels were estimated to be an incredible 200 meters higher than they are now. And the slow, millions of years long process of weathering or breaking down rock itself and eroding it away, the tenacious flow of the Colorado River twists its way through the southwest of the U.S., carving an even deeper Grand Canyon. Perhaps the most famous form of environmental change exists in the example of climate change. Between 360 and 260 million years ago, a series of cold periods resulted in Earth being at least 15 degrees cooler on average than it is today. Around the time of the dinosaur extinction, Earth's average temperature was over 80 degrees, which is significantly warmer than the 58.3 degrees it is today. Of course, the climate change story is ongoing, and the current chapter includes climactic changes at a rate faster than many in the past, but this time it's due to human influence. Other than the slow geologic processes of plate tectonics or weathering and erosion, which take place over millions of years, other events have the capacity to change ecosystems as well. Some are catastrophic and disastrous, including earthquakes, hurricanes, and wildfires. Others, though, can be attributed to changing food or water availability. Many animals are well known for their migratory behavior. Animals may migrate to avoid harm when natural disasters strike or to relocate 
to more appropriate habitats when the seasons change or as they search for food. The Mongolian gazelle, which inhabits East Central Asia, will migrate over a 40 to 50,000 square kilometer range in search of food. The white ibis, a bird found in the eastern part of the Gulf of Mexico, will migrate seasonally to locate and utilize appropriate breeding sites. Some portions of moose populations in northern Europe relocate in search of food and to find the protection from predators that deep snow can afford. In an earlier topic video, we saw that species have a range of conditions that they can tolerate and still potentially survive under. But within that range is a more restricted range that represents the ideal or optimal conditions for that species. When conditions deviate from the optimal range, it begins to put physiological stress on the organism. The organism then begins to suffer adversely, putting its survival at risk. Exceeding the range of tolerance means exceeding the range of potential survival. A number of variables go into establishing an organism's optimal preferred niche. They include temperature, nutrients in the soil, salinity, salt content, pH, the speed at which water is moving, and how much light there is. After a disturbance or disruption to an ecosystem occurs, the series of changes that the ecosystem experiences is called succession. The recovery of an ecosystem from a disturbance often results in a habitat that looks very different than the one that existed prior to the disturbance. Succession can create a habitat with different topography, different availability of abiotic resources, and a different level of biodiversity. There are two forms of succession, primary succession and secondary succession. Primary succession occurs following a disturbance that removes or buries soil, volcanic eruptions that produce lava flows, rock falls, and the recession of glaciers that expose bare rock all essentially create habitats that are soil-free. Since soil is necessary for plants to grow and plants are necessary for animals to survive, lacking soil may, at first, make, make it seem impossible for life to survive. In fact, although primary succession can potentially take a very long time on the scale of decades to centuries, it does result in the formation of new soil that can ultimately support larger and more complex plant species. Primary succession begins with bare rock. The first species that can exist in this habitat are called pioneer species. Many pioneer species include species of mosses and lichens. They are small photosynthetic organisms that grow close to the ground and spread out in a mat-like fashion. As they live and grow, they produce compounds that very slowly begin to dissolve the minerals found in the rock. The minerals are then taken in by the mosses and lichens, promoting their growth even further. As these pioneer species eventually die, their decomposition provides an organic, carbon-based component to the minerals being dissolved from the rock. After many cycles of the lives and deaths of pioneer species, a thin layer of soil begins to form in which fast-growing species like ferns and grasses can establish themselves. The grasses and ferns, like pioneer mosses and lichens, live, grow, die, and decompose, contributing even more material to a successively deeper soil layer. That deeper soil allows for more complex, slower-growing shrubs to survive. And by now, we would expect to see some animal species being able to survive here, or at least migrate through. Their presence contributes nutrient-rich waste, as does their death and decomposition. Ultimately, after enough time and this repetitive cycle of life, death, and decomposition contributing to the formation of deeper, richer soil, makes it possible for a biodiverse climax community to exist. Since not all disturbances remove or bury soil, 
secondary succession occurs. In order for secondary succession to occur, the topsoil has to remain after the disturbance. So although potentially devastating, fires, tornadoes, and even human activity like logging at least leave the soil behind, allowing for more rapid recovery of the ecosystem. Because the soil remains, fast-growing plants can quickly re-establish themselves as wind or migrating animals transport their seeds. Since plants are able to return relatively quickly, the ecosystem can support animals more quickly as well. Some species in an ecosystem have a particularly important or critical role to play. This can be true even if that species population size doesn't seem to imply anything about its importance. Some of the earliest arch construction dates back over 6,000 years. In the world of architecture, arches are often constructed with a special stone placed at the top in the center. This special stone is called the keystone and its job is to lock all of the other stones in place and help to distribute the weight of the arch, stabilizing the entire structure. In ecology, a keystone species is one that has a disproportionately important role to play, even though they may be few in number in their habitat. Were the keystone to be removed from an arch, it would lose its structural integrity and collapse. When a keystone species in a community is harmed or eliminated, it triggers a chain reaction, often detrimental, with all of the other species in the habitat that are associated with it. The sea otter is a predator of sea urchins. Sea otters keep the sea urchin population in check, preventing them from consuming too much kelp, which is an important producer in coastal marine environments. In a previous video, we saw the importance of the wolves of Yellowstone keeping the elk population at bay. Elephants in the dry season use their tusks to dig for water, and not only they, but other animals benefit from this search for water as well. As the elephants move through the forest and consume plants and the seeds from those plants, they are important in dispersing those seeds as they continue to migrate leaving the seeds behind in their waste. Sea stars, like the one here, are an important predatory species that feeds on mussels and clams and other bivalves, maintaining biodiversity within their community. Beavers are a great example of a keystone species. As ecosystem engineers, they modify their habitat when they build dams creating flooded areas and establishing new ecological niches from which other species can benefit. In the seemingly barren environment of a desert, the saguaro cactus is important because it acts as a shelter and nesting place for many bird species. Because the cacti fruits ripen during the time of year when water is largely unavailable, those fruits are an important source of moisture for desert mammals, insects, and birds. Even microorganisms can be considered keystone species. There are two known species of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. As a critical component of the nitrogen cycle, they are credited with making it possible for plants to get the nitrogen they need to construct their biological molecules. To monitor the health of ecosystems, scientists often take direct measurements of conditions within them. Temperature, pH, pollutants, and soil nutrients can all be measured and monitored to evaluate the overall health of an ecosystem. But as we saw earlier, deviation from optimal conditions can cause harm to the health of a plant or animal species long before conditions get so bad that they can't survive at all. Indicator species are those that begin to demonstrate the symptoms of detrimental environmental changes before others do. More often than not, they are specialists or are able to survive only within a very narrow range of environmental conditions. The lichens that grow on the sides of trees and rocks are especially sensitive to certain kinds of air pollutants. Monitoring their health 
would give scientists an indication of the concentration of those pollutants in the atmosphere. Euglena are a single-celled aquatic organism, and they can be studied to determine and measure the presence of DNA-damaging genotoxic compounds in water. Many species of amphibian are an important indicator species for toxins in air and water, since they do a portion of their respiration directly through their skin. This makes them extra sensitive to aquatic and atmospheric pollutants. Ozone, when it's found at low altitudes near the surface of the earth, is an air pollutant. The leaves of some plant species are easily harmed by ozone, therefore seeing this kind of damage is a sign that harmful concentrations of ozone are present. The caddisfly is a good indicator of water quality for ponds and lakes. And even birds like this spotted owl are an important indicator of the overall health of a forest. After all, a forest that is healthy enough to support high-level consumers like that must have a very large, biodiverse collection of species at lower trophic levels. And that wraps up our look at these three topics. As always, thank you for watching and take care.